Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this evening's uh, meeting. Um, be before we stand for a minute silence for two of our ex-colleagues who uh, passed away over Christmas, I'd just like to say a few words about these two colleagues. Uh, Councillor and honorary alderman, our only honor honorary alderman in all the time of North Town say, uh, uh, Lawrence Gove, SMBE, who passed away in December at the age of 89. Lawrence actually served this council and the borough of, of uh, the county borough of Tynemouth for over 50 years, uh, 37 of those years with North Tyneside Council, during which time he, uh, he had various roles. He was the deputy leader of the Conservative group. He was the leader of the Conservative group as well at one point, um, uh, Deputy Mayor, Chairman of the Council, and indeed he also was a temporary Mayor through a, a tricky period early on when the Mayor at that particular time resigned. He was also Mayor of Tynemouth in his time, and I, th I think for those of us who knew him, uh, his favourite words were, quite frankly, and um, I think he was a, a really nice chap. The, the, the other councillor was Alex Cowie, who passed away on Sunday morning. Alex served in Wheatstlade Ward from 2010 to 2014 and was a very well respected, along with Lawrence, who was the same ilk, as it were, though there were different political parties. Um, so I'd like everyone to stand for a minute's silence, please. Thank you very much. We, we now move on to the presentation of the Whitley Bay Town Cup. Whitley Bay Town Cup this year has been awarded to Whitley Bay Sporting Club in recognition for their work done to get people involved in playing sports, but also their charity work that they undertake and the opportunities they give to young people to pursue potential career paths environmental work, engineering course, football training courses, all sorts of different events. They're well supported by schools. They, they help schools and assist schools to raise funds for various things. And I think they're a worthy recipient. So I'd like to invite um, um, Robert Nixon to receive. I'd like to say a few words on behalf of Whitley Bay Sporting Club. Uh, I'd just like to thank the chairman, the elected mayor, and all the councillors for the award of the trophy to the club. Just to give a little bit of background about the, the Sporting Club, 
founded in 1960 as Whitley Bay Boys Club. Um, it was based behind the ice rink in Whitley Bay Young People's Centre, which is still there now, you might know it. Um, this was at the, we, we became the football side of that um, group, and then, but in 2015, a new committee came in and we moved away from the, the Young People's Centre. We became a charity of our own right, um, and obviously we deal with all the paperwork that which that involves. Um, the club's really grown since then, and we currently have 670 players, with about 70 players come along on a Saturday morning to Valley Gardens for a development school. Anyone aged three to eight can come along to that. So basically if you can walk and you're out with nappies, you can come along to it. Um, the club now, we have 47 teams aged from under seven to seniors. So we have players from six to 38. That's I think it's the oldest senior player. Um, we have seven girl, sold girls teams now, girl Pacific teams. And we have over 100 coaches, who, and, and everyone in the club's a volunteer. So the committee of 10 is all volunteers, we all have full-time jobs, and we have over 100 coaches as well. Um, moving forward, you know, we, we do, it's not just about football, though. We're, we're really careful when we became a charity because we didn't want to work all with the boys club, but with having girls teams and seniors teams, really wanting to move away from the boys and the titles, so we became with the sporting club. Um, but now we we even branching away from football, so we do um, separate strength and condition sessions, which is medicine, balls, and running with parachutes and things like that. Um, we'll start kickboxing classes. We do um, futsal, which is sort of an indoor foot football with a heavy ball, so it stays on the ground. And so we are branching away from football, so we're not just all about that. Um, we currently we don't have a, a current base as such, so people, a lot of people mix it up with would be a football club or base out of Fox Hunters. Um, we pl play with play at seven different schools across North Townside, so Valley Gardens, Whitley High, Monkseaton Middle, Shimua, um, and we have a really good relationship with all the schools we play at. But with the next stage of the club is to get our own base, and we're, we're currently speaking to the council and uh, Northumberland Estates regarding some land. So hopefully I might be back one day talking to you all about some land. Um, so there, that is the next next stage of the, the club, to push, push the club forward. But once again, thanks very much for the award and good luck the rest of the night. Just for the members of the club, if you want to leave, you know, we're quite happy. You, you don't have to stay. You can leave as well. <laughs> We now move on to public questions, and the first question is from Ms. Hawkins. Is Ms. Hawkins present this evening? Yes. Then, would you like to come down and ask your question, or take it as read? Is she coming down, or is she taking What are, what are the perceived benefits of moving the Shields Ferry landing from North Shields to Royal Quays? Councillor Johnson, I understand you're going to answer yeah, thanks, this. Chair. Um, thank you for the question. Can I first of all make clear that we are not moving the ferry landing from North Shields to Royal Quays? The Council have been talking to Nexus about the work they must do with the ferry landing in North Shields and the possibilities of the future. As part of these conversations, Nexus are looking at the site of the current landing and whether it would be beneficial to move the move it to closer to North Shields Fish Key. In addition, we have spoken about the new, a new weekend service to the Marina at Royal Keys, how that might work, given the huge number of visitors who arrive via the Port of Tyne Ferry Terminal and the opportunity to connect to Royal Keys and the surrounding area. There are no plans to change the current service as important to people who travel between North Shields and South Shields for work and pleasure. As part of our work on the regeneration of North Shields Fish Key, the Chief Executive and the Deputy Mayor are looking at opportunities to support the growing business confidence around North Shields Fish Key as a popular food and drink destination. 
as part of our ambitious plans for North Tyneside. So we're not, we're not currently planning to move the ferry away from, from North Shields Fish Quay. Do you, do you have a supplementary question? Can, can you use the microphone because we can't hear? Um, I presume there'll be a public consultation. Could you give us some idea of when? So we are not planning on moving it away from North Shields Fish Key. Our discussion was very much regards to introducing a triangle service on a weekend as opposed to moving the ferry landing from North Shields Fish Key to the Royal Keys. So as there's no current plan to move the ferry terminal, at the moment there would be no public consultation. If in future we have to move to ferry land, if we plan on moving to ferry land on North Shields Fish Key, consultation would come forward. But at this stage, it's very early stages, so there's no public consultation date yet. Okay, thank you. Qu question two and three will be answered together, but both the individuals who are asking the questions will be allowed to ask their their questions separately. So do we have Mr. Radbourne here? If you could come down and ask your question, please. Yeah, good evening. I'm Phil Radbourne. I'm a resident of Whitley Bay and a volunteer member of St Mary's Sail Watch. Uh, my question really uh, tonight is the driving force within the council. Would it be possible for you to tell me what commitments you and your cabinet have for the future of the St Mary's Nature Reserve, both in terms of overall management strategies and specifically balancing visitor attendance whilst reducing the wildlife disturbance levels. Could I also ask Miss Bennett to come forward and she's here and ask her question? Hello, my name's Sally Bennett and I'm the Is that okay? Right, okay. Hi, my name's Sally Bennett. I'm the coordinator for St Mary's Seal Watch. Thank you for allowing me to come and speak on behalf of the group. Although I'm not a resident, I hope you'll appreciate that I have, through my work as coordinator for St Mary's Seal Watch, shown my loyalty to the area. St Mary's Island Reserve is, to me, the jewel in North Tyneside's crown. To have such a wonderful wilderness so close to urbanisation is truly a precious thing for all those that enjoy being amongst nature. Nature reserves and other open spaces help wildlife thrive whilst providing people with areas where they can reap the benefits of the natural world. When local authorities declare a local nature reserve, they take on the duty of care to manage and look after the site. It is therefore the responsibility of this local authority to ensure visitor pressure is managed in a way that alleviates damage and disturbance caused to the wildlife habitats on this protected site. St so Mary's Seal Watch and its growing team of volunteers from the North Tyneside area has dedicated many thousands of volunteer hours to help maintain the delicate and often precarious balance between visitors and the wildlife on this much-loved site maximising the visitor appeal whilst helping to safeguard the natural environment and the wildlife it supports. St Mary Seal Watch intends to continue with its commitment to our local wildlife and the many visitors who come to enjoy it. Whilst we applaud measures put in place by North Tyneside Council to help alleviate, to some extent, the impact of visitor pressure, we know these measures are not enough. A convincing commitment by North Tyneside Council to realise its management responsibility and fully address the impact of visitor pressure on the wildlife habitats of this reserve is essential for the future of this site. So again I ask, as the driving force within the Council, would it be possible for you to tell me what commitment you and your Cabinet have for the future of this nature reserve? Thank you. The question will be answered by Councillor Carl Johnson, the Environment Cabinet Member. Thank you, Chair. I can absolutely show you that this Council is absolutely committed to managing this important area and has commissioned an independent expert ecologist to produce an ecological management plan for the local nature reserve. Groups of an interest in St Mary's local nature reserve have been consulted on the plan, which we will publish in February 2019. As a council, we recognise that there is a delicate balance to achieve between protecting the environment and encouraging sustainable tourism to a major heritage attraction like St Mary's Lighthouse. 
However, we will continue to work with volunteers and groups in the area such as St Mary's Island Wetland Conservation to find an acceptable solution for the whole borough. Thank you. Mr Radbourne, do you have a, a supplementary question for Councillor Johnson? It is a supplementary question as a member of the SEAL Watch and the anticipated management plan that's um, hopefully going to be circulated in the next month. What do you see as St Mary's SEAL Watch role in that plan? Like you say, as part of that plan, we have consulted with you know, every other group, every group that has an interest in the area, and that has all been taken into account. And when we publish our plans next month, that will become absolutely clear what we see, people's role, what our role is, and what the other roles are currently there. Ms. Bennett, do you have a supplementary question? Hi. As we have already been waiting since 1992 for a management plan and management strategy for St Mary's Island Local Nature Reserve, can the Cabinet say on a scale of 1 to 10 what its level of commitment is? Well, I wasn't born in 1992, so I wasn't around then. No, I'm sure However, you'll However, I can absolutely say that we will produce our report next month and it will show our commitment to the nature reserve, and you will absolutely see that. It will come out in February next, next, so it's next month, February 2019, and that will show what our commitment is. But like I said, we are absolutely committed to protecting St. Mary's Island as an ecological destination and a tourism destination. And we'll show that next month in our report. Thank you. Question four is from Mr. Stevenson. Is he in attendance? No? And we'll just take it as read. Councillor Johnson, Cabinet Member for Environment, yet again. And Transport, sorry. We're working your hard tonight. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you want to increase in the question, answer, not the Chair, that you want to increase the number of people purchasing an electric vehicle. Unfortunately, the government do not have a full grant funding for the installation of charging points at on-street locations. And there is no grant funding available for on-street charging facilities for specific households. If the government want more people to take up electric vehicles, then it will need to have to consider the costs associated with this and offer funding regimes. As I'm sure you will appreciate, this is not just an issue of Tyneside, but something that will affect every local authority across the country. This is because the cost of digging up pavements to install cables are far beyond the resources that we have now and will ever likely to have in the future. Therefore, this is a national problem. However, the Council can also not permit the installation of charging cables which cross the public footwear for safety reasons at this moment. I would however like to highlight the support, support and the growth in low carbon technologies as a priority of North Tyneside Council. We have a commitment on North Tyneside transfer strategy to encourage wider adoption of low carbon technologies and our local plan states that whenever appropriate we will require developers to provide charging points for EVs as part of new developments in the borough brought through the planning process. Because of this, North Tyneside already provide charging points for electric vehicles in several locations, including our public car parks in Whitley Bay and North Shields. We are currently working in partnership with our neighbouring authorities in the North East to explore further opportunities to develop and improve <coughs> environmental vehicle charging provision in our public car parks. This provides best opportunities available to us as a local authority to secure further visible and accessible EV charging facilities in line with our strategic objectives. Of course, we will keep watching Keep a watch and brief on all potential funding streams in the area and we'll alert you to any future funding opportunities that become available. We now move on to question five and that's from Mr Mill. Is Mr Mill here in attendance? If you could come forward and ask your question please. Good evening. Recently, the council made the decision to demolish the footbridge on Borough Road. What efforts were made by the council in order to preserve this footbridge, to which many hundreds of people believe to be a part of the town's heritage? And may an extension be made to this decision in order for local residents to attempt to find funding for repairing or replacing the bridge? Councillor Johnson, Cabinet Member for Transport, Environment, and seems to be anything else tonight to answer the question. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your question. We have maintenance responsibility for over 100 bridges, 900 kilometres of highway, and 1,200 kilometres of footpaths in this borough, which for a borough our size is substantial, all of which require regular inspection and maintenance regime. The local transport plan, we, in the allocation of local transport, we, in the local transport plan, these, again, 900 kilometres of highway, 1,200 kilometres of footpath, and over 100 bridges. We do not have an opportunity to bid for external grant funding from the likes of, we do have the opportunity to bid for external grant funding from the likes of the Department of Transport and the Heritage Lottery Fund, but unfortunately, this bridge does not meet the criteria to access this type of funding. Borough Road Footbridge is a metal bridge that was built in the 1930s and unfortunately is fast approaching the end of its service of life. I think it's important to highlight that the uses of the bridge have declined over the years. Service has shown that pedestrians tend to cross Borough Road at street level in the vicinity of Addison Street Junction and the bridge has crossed less than 100 times in any one day. Borough Road Footbridge is also an antisocial behaviour black spot with regular report of incidents of dangerous and antisocial behaviour. Obviously, we along with the police try to manage this. In fact, the police installed a CCTV camera at this location last year in an attempt to cancel antisocial behaviour evidence to take positive action. Unfortunately, the camera was vandalised beyond repair within a few days of being installed. There have been suggestions of raising the sides of the bridge to prevent objects being thrown over or installing nets either side of the bridge to manage the antisocial behaviour. But we haven't been able to arrive at an affordable or credible solution to this issue. It is a priority of this council to maintain its roads, footpaths and bridges and we, set, and we set out our priorities through the Highways Asset Management Plan. The key theme, theme is to ensure our limited resources are targeted in the area of greatest need and where the most benefit, high, most, most benefit to highways and pedestrian users. Difficult choices therefore have to be made in terms of managing the highway asset. In our hamp, we identified Tanners Bank Bridge, Bridge as our strategic priority in the North Shields area. We are currently in partnership with Nexus, seeking funding from the Department for Transport that will be used to reconstruct Tanners Bank Bridge to give improved headroom, enable a public transport improvement serving North Shield Fish Key, supporting local shops, restaurants and businesses, again in line with our strategic priorities. Unfortunately, we have exhausted the potential funding avenues for Borough Road Bridge, and I'm sorry to say again that this footbridge does not meet, meet the criteria to access external funding. The public have made clear to the Mayor and the Mayor has made clear to me that improving the condition of our footpaths and highways is a key priority. With footpaths where the footfall is high and the condition is poor, our immediate investment priority. Spending what would be a massive amount of our limited local transport fund funding on replacing Borough Road Bridge would be at odds with our current priorities. It would take much needed investment away from the footpaths and highways that are being used by North Tainted residents every day. You could say it would be taken away from the many to give to the few. In these challenging financial times, we do have to prioritise our resources as we can't afford to do anything we'd like to. The demolition of the bridge is now subject to a plan of permission and application has been submitted. I have, however, asked our officers not to progress the plan and application until a new safe fit for purpose crossing has been agreed. Of course, there is a formal consultation process attached to this where any comments and objections we receive will inform a final decision. I hope that we will see from a response to even other council, we have limited resources available, unable to do everything that we would like to do, but we have the best interests of the borough in mind when setting out our investment priorities. Do you have a supplementary question? Um, just that. Um, the footbridge itself is 82 years old. There's been something going over that road for nine on 200 years. How that when the, this bridge that's there was initially built, I believe it was given a lifespan of up to 130 years, which would give us another 50 years. How has the bridge been allowed to get in such a state of disrepair in such a short time? Councillor Johnson. What we can say is, yes, the bridge is that lifespan, but our surveys have shown that this bridge is coming towards the end of its life. The original lifespan has clearly deteriorated further than we expected because of conditions on the time. It's on the fish key, it's there. Of course, when the bridge was originally built, it was well used because Smith Dock was still a working dock at the time. A lot of factors have contributed to the reduction of lifespan expected in the original time. 
However, the survey does certainly show it's coming to the end of its life, and that is a fact as opposed to an opinion. So the bridge is coming towards a serviceable life. The other things might well show why it has happened, and in that report, it might consider that, but it absolutely is coming to the end of its serviceable life at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mill. We now move on to uh, apologies for absence. I have apologies from no, councillors Hodgson, Wheatman, Clark, Osborne, and Brooks. Is there anyone else? No. Then we now move on to declarations of interest. Has anyone got any declarations of interest? Councillor Samuels. Uh, can I declare interest in item 11, question 2, in that my wife is a governor at Woodlawn School? Thank you very much. Anyone else? No? Then we now move on to the, the minutes of the last council meeting. Can we agree the minutes of the last council meeting? Right. We're now on to... The report from the CFR North Tyneside Community Strategy 2019-24 um, and I'll hand over to Councillor Carol Burles, the Cabinet Member. Thank you Chair. I'm pleased to present this report which seeks approval of the final proposals for 2019-24 to CFR North Tyneside Community Safety Strategy. The strategy is included as part of the Council's budget and policy framework. However, it is developed and owned by our local, our local community safety partnership, which is required by law. As, as the responsible Cabinet member, I am privileged to chair the partnership and I am delighted to welcome the council, to the Council this evening the representatives from each of the member organisations of the partnership board. Um, Chair, if we could take a moment, um, I would like to ask our partners if they would like to come to the lectern and introduce themselves. Can I, can I also say, can we start with my Vice Chair, Jeff? Beg your pardon. That's better. Good evening, councillors. My name is Jeff Both. I'm the station manager for North Tyneside, covering Wolves End and Tynemouth. Thank you. Good evening, councillors. Rebecca Ditchburn, the community relations officer for Nexus for the North Tyneside area, and I'm a non strategic partner of the board. Good evening, I'm Leslie Pyle, I'm the Domestic Abuse Coordinator for the Local Authority, here to uh, represent the Domestic Abuse Partnership, which reports in to the Community Safety Partnership Board. Good evening, my name is Adrian Draco, I'm the Designated Nurse for Safeguard and Adults at North Tyneside Clinical Commissioning Group, and that's all represent on the partnership. Good evening, councillors. I'm Chief Superintendent Janice Hutton. I am the Area Commander for Northern Area Command, which covers North Tyneside and Northumberland. Good evening, Wendy Burke, Director of Public Health. Good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Scott. Stop laughing. Uh, <laughs> and I represent the council uh, on the Strategic Partnership Board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, partners. It's lovely to see you all together again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and to continue, um, the Crime and Disorder Act 1998 places a duty on responsible authorities to work together to tackle crime, disorder, substance misuse and reoffending within communities. We do this through a local community safety partnership, which in our borough is the Safer North Tyneside Partnership. The current five-year strategy is due to expire on the 31st of March 2019. The report describes the process to date for developing the new strategy, <coughs> excuse me, which has included a comprehensive public consultation exercise involving a range of forums and partners as listed in the report. 
Overview and Scrutiny and Policy and Development Committee has also been involved as part of the policy framework. Council will be aware that while North Tyneside remains one of the safest spurs in the country in relation to actual crime levels, however, we face some real challenges in new and emerging types of crime. <coughs> Members will remember Dame Vera Baird's QC, uh, the Northumbria Police and Crime Commissioner, telling us about this when she attended the Council meeting in September and provided a detailed account um, of the challenges. The strategy is designed to capture those complex and cross-cutting issues to ensure that partners are focused on the key priorities that members of the public expect us to address. They reflect the priorities set by both our police and crime commissioner and elected mayor too. Uh, and I, as a cabinet member, ask the council to approve the recommendation in section 1.2 of the report. But I also may need to, ha uh, to highlight, and I hope um, we're going to get uh, the report up when we get into uh, the, the agenda proper on this, because there's a few typos um, on the version one, um, in some of the boxes, the, weren't, the wordings weren't actually complete. Um, so if people can refer to, when we get to that, if people can refer to what's up on the screen. Thank you, Chair. I understand, Councillor Samuel, you're seconding <coughs> this? Uh, formally, Chair, but I reserve the right to speak. Thank you. Do any members have questions? Councillor uh, Mason, nearly changed their name for you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, can I ask the Cabinet Member, if you look at page 7 of the, um, of the agenda, uh, under the heading Public Protection? So the, we always seen the procurement of uh, the mobile CCTV and there's a further mention of um, procurement further down as well. Who actually pays for this? Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, there's, uh, there's mention um, under the, the public protection um, of procurement. It mentions it a couple of times. Uh, so who actually, who actually pays for the procurement of the CCTV? Right. Well, we actually, the CCTV, how it's actually organised, the procurement project, um, we actually have that, we've changed it, we're now into a different building, and uh, where we've gone now is, um, we're in Killingworth, um, the finances that come in, we do actually do um, monitoring elsewhere, and we do do a service, so we do get money in from that, but um, the council actually do that. So it's obviously included in what uh, budget? Absolutely. Yeah, great. Thank you. Councillor Wallace. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my question is also on the, on the question of the CCTV um, provision. Uh, it says that there's a recent, in, on, in, likewise on par page 7, in the same paragraph, um, it says that um, there has been uh, a procurement project recently for CCTV for the renewal of current um, equipment across the borough, and I'm just wondering when that equipment uh, will be operational, please. It's operational now, Chair. Thank you. Did I see someone else's hand up there? Anyone else? Then can we move on to comments? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. I've got just a couple of comments. Um, first, uh, to thank all the uh, partners and members of the, the board who are present tonight and their teams for the work which they do. Uh, safety is a matter of concern to all our residents, I'm sure, in all our wards, and so I would like to thank uh, all those uh, staff and teams for their, for their work in this regard. Uh, my second comment was to say that I am glad to see that the scope of the strategy has been extended to cover things like child sexual exploitation, uh, which, whilst sadly um, it's clear from a number of prosecutions, has been ongoing for many years in various areas of the country, uh, I don't think it was 
so um, apparent or so recognised the last time this strategy was reviewed. And so I think we do welcome the extension of the strategy to include the various problems which have become apparent uh, in recent years. Thank you. Yes, the Mayor. <laughs> I would just like to sort of reiterate some of that to bit, Councillor Wallace, and say thank to our members of the committee who've come along tonight and give their time to be quite honest. And, and I, I agree that we're extremely lucky in this borough to have all those services come together to make sure that our residents are safe and secure. So thank you very much indeed. Did I see your hand up, Councillor O'Shea? Yes. Um, Thank you very much for calling me, Chair. Can I commend this um, strategy to Council? I think it's, uh, it shows some significant good work and good work am amongst partners. And a big thank you to the partners who have been introduced to us tonight. Um, one thing I would like to talk about in particular is on big page number 20 under crime and disorder. And it makes reference there to crime and disorder associated with the nighttime economy. And I have to say that this has been a significant issue in Whitley Bay area about the nighttime economy, and five years ago it was almost out of uh, um, it was out of this world. Some of the stuff that was happening there, but working very closely with the police and their partners, I think the the situation in parts of Whitley Bay has been substantially improved um, around uh, certainly the nighttime economy and dealing with um, with the public protection people around some of the late night late night licensing which caused immense problems in the area. So it's been a major success in Whitley Bay around the nighttime economy. So thank you, a big thank you to, uh, to Councillor Burgess, Burgess and her partners for having such an, an active uh, strategy in place, which has been very, very successful. Thank you. Would, would one of the partners like to comment on that? Or I'm not going to read all of the stuff I've got in that file there. I'll just put that down there now. Um, thank you very much for those comments. Uh, they're really welcomed. Uh, and as, as you point out, um, this isn't just a you know, you know an issue and something that the police can do on our own. I've, I say this at regular meetings that I attend with my staff and officers and with, with partnership meetings that we do better when we work together to solve these issues and use everything that we can use to tackle those issues, whether that's linked to nighttime economy um, or, you know, the other serious instances that we've raised, um, child sexual exploitation, cyber crime, modern day slavery, whatever it is, we work better together on it. And, and I do appreciate the, the partnership that we have here. Thank you. Councillor Green. Thank you, Chair. Two small points. I just want to congratulate the young mayor on uh, being successful in securing funding for the anti-bullying schools campaign. Um, it, it's actually trying to get um, our young people involved in um, making this, the place safer, not just for their own peer groups, but for older people as well. And, and bullying, whether we like it or not, is um, in our schools, and I think um, this is, is to be laudable. Uh, the other thing about it is to have a, a, a policy like this um, does give people confidence and reassurance, and I think the way in which um, particularly our police forces work at the moment within the communities um, is um, really very reassuring, particularly for older people. There is a uh, an awareness that they can, people can work with the police and there is an, a, a sort of an upbeat um, feeling that we will get the, the burglars or the, the, the vandals or whatever it is that was within the community, which I think actually having uh, the joint partnership and working in this way is actually already playing, uh, proving successful. So um, I congratulate everybody involved with it and thank you very much for the time you've spent pulling it all together. Thank you. I'm sure our young mayor will be very pleased with your comments. Does anyone else want to say anything? No? Back to Councillor Burdis to sum up. Thank you, Chair. And again, um, lots of thank yous, really. Thank you for having um, 
the dialogue between uh, across parties um, because that's really important as well. And our partners, uh, thank you for tonight, but thank you for all the work you do um, throughout the year to get us to the stage we've got to with this partnership. Um, and uh, also, you know, like I want to thank the council officers, um, Lindsay, Janine, and Colin. You know, they they've put a lot of work in as well, and, and as you know, they they look they look after you uh, quite well. Um, and on that, I mean, one of the good things, the comment that was made about Whitley Bay and about the nighttime economy. The only comment I wanted to say is that we are now inviting. Um, after this has been launched, at the launch, we're going to be inviting the street pastors to be part of the partnership as well. Okay, so on that, thank you very much, Chair. Can we now move to the vote? Those in favour, please show. I think it's unanimous. Thank you very much. We now move on. To, uh, you don't have to stay if you don't want to. You know, and first out of the door doesn't get a prize. <laughs> no, you've got to stay. <coughs> we now move on to item six, designation of statutory roles. And it's over to our elected mayor. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the authority is required to designate an officer of the authority as monitoring officer pursuant to the Local Government and Housing Act 1989 and to appoint an electoral registration officer, returning officer, and acting returning officer pursuant to the representation of the People Act 1983. As members will be aware, at its meeting held in July 2018, Council agree that Paul Hansen, our Chief Executive, carry out the roles of elector Electoral Registration Officer, Returning Officer, and Acting Returning Officer, and that Louise Watson undertake the role of Monitoring Officer following the departure from the Council of Vivian Greary, Vivian Greary former Head of Law and Governance. These designations were agreed on a temporary basis pending the completion of a review of the Senior Officer structure. And now, that Bryn Roberts has been appointed the post of Head of Law and Governance, Council has requested to agree, to agree to Mr. Roberts being designated as Monitoring Officer, Electoral Registration Officer, Returning Officer and Acting Returning Officer with effect from the 25th of February 2019, the date on which Mr. Roberts will commence employment with this authority. I would therefore like to move the recommendation in paragraph 1.2 of the report, which will enable the authority to fulfill its duties in relation to the statutory roles. Councillor Pickard, I understand I'm your second. second. Let's reserve the right to speak. Right. I would hope that there's no comments. Uh, can we just agree this then? Sure. Thank you very much. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. I'm delighted that Bryn oh. hasn't joined us this evening, oh. so I right. would like you to stand up so we know who you are. <laughs> we'll be after you, Bryn, if it goes I, wrong. I told him that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can we now move on to the programme of the meetings for 2019-2020? And I understand, Councillor Pickard, you might have something to say on this. Yes, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Council has requested to approve a timetable of meetings for the 19, to 2019 stroke 20 and to agree those dates of Council meetings during 1920 at which questions will be taken from members of the public. The timetable has been drawn up using similar principles upon which the current year's timetable is based, as set out in section 1.5.2 of the report, and is based upon the commencement times that were agreed for the current municipal year. The timetable also includes dates for member development and for members' briefings. It is also proposed that as the current year, three council meetings will be designated for public questions, i.e. the meetings to be held on the 25th of July 2019, 28th of November 2019 and 16th of January 2020. I'd also like to move a third recommendation, and that is that the members' support group 
be asked to review the frequency and effectiveness of the members' briefings and report back. The, uh, so with that additional recommendation, if it's agreed by the, the Council, I'd move the recommendations of this report. Thank you. I understand, Councillor Burles, your second in Thank this? Thank you, yes, sir. Uh, second didn't reserve the right to speak. Right. Has anyone got any questions? <coughs> Comments? And can we agree? agree? Thank you very much. Um, I'll now move the common seal. <laughs> Pardon? It's called that deals with seal. Oh, call deals with seals. Oh, sorry. I didn't get, quite get that one. Um, right, it's now on to Chair's announcements. Um, well, to be perfectly honest, we just do what it is we normally do. We go to events here, there and everywhere in the borough. But I think it's, it's very important for members to, to know that when I took the chair, the role of chair, one of my charities was defibrillators in schools, and what, what has actually happened is uh, this was triggered initially by one of our MPs who happened to be talking about defibrillators and how there was a lack of them in the schools. That's Mary Glyndon, the MP for North Tynesay. When we, when we investigated this, we found that there was a small number of our schools who didn't have defibrillators. And when I started to make inquiries as to, to why they didn't have defibrillators, it was quite interesting to hear the answers from some of the governors. And the answer was basically they'd had to make a choice between books and a defibrillator, which I found very sad and very upsetting. However, we moved forward and uh, with the help of Mark Longstaff and Ian Bethan, um, we, we have managed to actually acquire the defibrillators for the schools. All the schools now have defibrillators, I think. Um, so we're protected as far as that is concerned. I'd also like to thank the council staff and some of the members here who are members of the, the council's chair's lottery um, because that is where the money has actually come from. And you know, it, it was a fair chunk of cash, but we've managed to actually do it just before Christmas. And personally, I'm very pleased about that. And I think as members of the council, you'll be very pleased that we are now pro protected as far as the use or the, the defibrillator actually being there. What is interesting is from this original thing on schools with defibrillators, we now have found out that there's quite a few members of the public who are getting involved in, in defibrillators within the borough itself. And we've, we've got to be honest, we're very pleased about that because um, it can only help the residents of the borough. So thank you to all the council staff who have chipped up their hard-earned cash to actually pay for these and to the members who are members of the lottery. Thank you very much. Now move on to the... Mayor's announcements. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to take this opportunity to wish you all a Happy New Year, of course. <laughs> and I do hope that 2019 will be a productive year for all of us. I have welcomed Bryn to our council, but I think we would like to know that we're in good hands when he joins us in February, because Wayne is head of law and governance and he's from Middlesbrough. He has an extensive experience as a monitoring officer, including working in a mayoral authority and as part of a combined authority. So I'm sure he'll do a great job here in North Tyneside. In relation to the senior leadership team, because you're aware that some of our members went off to do other things, uh, we've been fortunate to appoint other people to that team. Uh, and the meeting on the 5th of December, we appointed John Sparks. Now, John, can we... Can you stand up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, John is Head of Regeneration and Eco Economic de Development here in North Tyneside. And of course, John, if you remember, used to work here in North Tyneside and he will be rejoining us following a decade working with Bridging Newcastle and Gated and delivering significant regeneration work with South Tyneside Council. And he's coming to join us in March. Is that correct, John? Well done. 
And of course, we had the opportunity to, and we have appointed a senior communications and marketing manager, James Muir. You're going to have to do the same, James. Welcome. Thank you very much. And James will be joining us on the 5th of February. And he comes from the NCJ Media, who issues and publishes the Journal, the Chronicle, and the Sunday Sun. So very, very welcome. And I'm glad you met. <laughs> and I look forward to work, and we all look forward to working with you. I think you may also be interested to know that the Daily Telegraph on the 4th of January named Whitney Bay in Tymouth is one of the best 10 places at British destinations to, to, to discover in 2019. <laughs> and I have to tell you, what was the, the reporter was so impressed. It was named as the hotspot for 2019. And you can imagine that many of us were really pleased to read this as a number of our businesses from North Tyneside have been included in this article by travel experts and shows our investment along the coast is really paying off. Because remember, when we started invest along the coast, we had some very, very negative publicity. So I'm pleased that it's becoming a positive place to talk about. And we're now sort of actually turning to other parts of the borough to do the same for them. I'm sure you will be all aware the national attention that this will help. It will help us to attract more visitors, attract businesses to the area, bring more investment to the borough, and helping the local economy to grow, thrive, and prosper. Because when people visit, they discover for themselves everything else we have to offer in this borough. Our beautiful parks, our open spaces, state-of-the-art leisure centers and great museums. And I want to pay tribute to many of you people sitting here, our officers and councillors, because we've been able to maintain and keep our libraries and leisure centres in-house, despite the £120 million worth of cuts we've had to do in the last few years. I think you've all done remarkably well. When you look at the other authorities who have to outsource their libraries outside their leisure centres, and I have to say, we have fought, we've kept 14 libraries and managed to keep them going in very, very difficult circumstances. To all of you who have been involved, to be quite honest, thank you so much indeed. It is much appreciated. We now move on to questions from members. Question one is from Councillor Austin. Would you like to ask a question or take it as read? Uh, yes, I'll ask the question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a recent report in both local and national newspapers named the 384 worst primary schools in England. And that's schools where the government standards for performance across eight mainstream subjects, including English and maths, had failed to be reached. Three of those schools were in North Tyneside, namely Forest Hall Primary, Percy Main Primary and Monk Seaton Middle School. Parents of pupils at those schools have understandably expressed their concerns. What assurances can the Mayor give that this issue will be investigated and measures taken to reverse the decline in performance? Councillor so earlier, I think, as a Cabinet member for Young People yes. in Education. Thank you for your question. The performance of our schools in North Tyneside is very important to the elected Mayor, Cabinet and myself. The newspaper report refers to outcomes for pupils at the end of year six and key stage two. Whilst our middle and primary schools had higher overall standards than those found nationally in 2018, we remain very focused on those schools that did not perform as well. You will of course be aware that there have been schools in the borough that have underperformed in the past, including Mugseaton High School close to your own ward, where we work with the school through our school improvement service to improve outcomes. Also have noticed that one of our schools in Whitley Bay was ranked in the top 10 secondary schools in the Northeast. In relation to Forest Hall Primary School, I can advise you that an officer group meets regularly to support the school to bring about the improvements necessary. There has been strong improvement in early years and across key stage one. Results in both phases were well above the national averages in 2018. The School Improvement Service continues to work with the school and are confident that the quality of provision will lead to improved outcomes in 2019. 
A review is due to be undertaken by the School Improvement Service later this term to confirm ongoing improvement. In relation to Percy Main Primary School, the new school leaders and new governors are very focused on rapidly improving outcomes. With significant support from the School Improvement Service, staff have begun to improve the quality of teaching confirmed through a, re a review by the School Improvement Service in December 2018. With regards to Monk Seton Middle School, following the work of a national leader of education in the school during 2017-18, a new head teacher, deputy head teacher, and assistant head teacher took up post in September 2018. And again, the School Improvement Service is working intensively in partnership with another national leader of education to support improvement in the school. A review by the School Improvement Service will be held later in January to confirm improvements and determine what further action needs to be taken. I would like to take this opportunity to thank and acknowledge the hard work of the School Improvement Service, who continue to maintain strong relationship with school leaders, governors, and between other service providers and the council, such as the locality teams. Because they know our schools as well, they are able to support and challenge effectively. The service uses well-established processes, such as a, raving, a raising achievement group, which brings together key officers around a vulnerable school. They also utilise trusted professionals both on the team and from schools such as National Leaders of Education who have secure subject knowledge and significant experience to bring about and sustain improvement across a wide range of school subjects and provision. This is happening during a time when our schools are dealing with ever increasing pressures because of continued central government cuts. It is worth noting that the Institute of Fiscal Studies reported in July 18 that per pupil spending has fallen by 8% since 2010. Despite government promises, these cuts in funding are set to continue with an estimated 5,000 schools, one in four primary and one in six secondary schools facing a real terms cut in spending in 2019. In addition, we are on the verge of a recruitment crisis in secondary education. A report in May 2018 suggested that by 2024, we will need an extra 47,000 secondary school teachers in England. Against this protect projection, the number of trainee teachers fell by almost 25% last year. At the same time, teachers are leaving the profession in increasing numbers. Some 11% of secondary teachers left the English state sector in the year to November. Only 48% of secondary classroom teachers in England have more than 10 years' experience, compared to an international average of 64%. The number of people applying for postgraduate teacher training in 2018-19 is down by a staggering 33% since last year. Also, the Teacher Development Trust reported last year that school spending on teacher training has dropped for the first time this decade. Some schools have reduced spending on books, computers and other learning resources in an effort to try and provide adequate CPD for teachers. Finally, it is worth remembering that there are 79 schools in North Tyneside and 87% of young people attend a good or outstanding school compared to a national average of 85%, something of which we should be proud. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary question? I do, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the answer. All elected members, obviously, over the years have been rightly proud of the excellent schools we've had um, in the borough for a long time. However, some of the concerns that have been described to me by parents are very worrying and also book the trend for England, which is actually uh, a trend of huge and impressive improvement in standards. I wondered if the Mayor would agree to report back to full council at a later date with details of the action plans for each school and whether they are succeeding in remedying the situation. Early. I don't think we would have a problem with coming back to you once those action plans have been put into place and completed. Um, as I say, there are a number of reviews going on in each of those schools, uh, peer reviews, uh, to ensure that standards are rising. Councillor Drummond, I think you're the next one for a question. Do you want to take it as read or read it? Can I read out, please, Chair? Yes, no. Would the elected mayor like to comment and also join Councillor Craven and I in congratulating the hard work and determination of pupils, staff, and governors at Woodlawn School in Monkseaton South Ward following their recent Ofsted inspection, moving from needs improvement to good? I 
I think Councillor Early, you're down to answer this yeah. one. But I think the Mayor wants to share. All right, okay. <laughs> Do you want to go first? <laughs> Would the Mayor like to go first then? Well, I want to Okay. But I just want to say to be quite honest that I write to every school because we don't let's cut, come, uh, kid ourselves. There are a number of schools who get into trouble and there's been a number over the years, but we work very, very hard with that improvement service to bring them up to standards. And this will continue to happen. Only yesterday, Councillor Drummond, uh, the, uh, the actually government brought in another change for schools. So, you know, we we'll have to balance that every year, every day as we go along. But, you know, we we'll have a fantastic improvement service, to be quite honest, that will support every school that fails. But, in all honesty, I think the Woodlawn School have done tremendously well. I will definitely write to them, as I do to all the schools who come out today measures, and congratulate the head, the pupils, and the staff, because to get from where they were to good has been tremendous, tremendous hard work. So I'll do that. And over to you, uh, Councillor Early. Thank you. I'll try not to repeat some of what you just said. <laughs> um, Following on from my last answer, I think this is a good example of our partnership working to move the school from needs improvement to good. Like you, Mayor, I'm very proud of the achievement of the pupils, staff and governors at Woodlawn, and it demonstrates how effective the support from our school improvement service can be, working with our schools to gain some fantastic results, both for the school and its pupils. Woodlawn School has been on a journey of improvement for over four years and I am delighted that Ofsted have now recognised the strong improvement and the high quality of education at the school. Whilst the school is judged to be good overall, the report evaluates leadership and management and the personal development, behaviour and welfare of pupils to be outstanding. Ofsted noted that the, teacher, the head teacher's strong and inspirational leadership has ensured that Woodlawn School has made rapid improvements. It now provides a good education for its pupils. She is ably supported by a cohesive team that is passionate about improving outcomes for its pupils. And as a result of her outstanding leadership, the school is improving at a pace. Regarding behaviour, Ofsted said that behaviour in and around the school is outstanding. Pupils show awareness of the impact of their behaviours on others. They have an excellent understanding of, the right, of right and wrong and respond very well to the school's reward systems. As, as the Mayor has said, we will ensure that congratulations are offered to the school on behalf of the Council, the Governors, the Head Teacher, staff and pupils and their parents and carers. I would like to thank uh, Councillors Drummond and Craven for their support to the school during this time. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary question? I don't, Chair. Just thank you very much. Just seeing as everybody seems to want to be in on this uh, Woodlawn School, can I just mention that the Woodlawn Pudding Run, um, uh, I think we should congratulate Councillor Craven on taking part in it and finishing. We just thought people would be interested in that. Um, Question three, Councillor Thurloway, would you like to... Oh, sorry. No, I'm on question three. Question three, Councillor Thurloway. Yes, I would like to read it out, Chair. Right, fair enough. Thank you. I'm being bullied here. <laughs> would, the North Town, would the North Tyneside elected mayor and our other representatives work to ensure the regeneration of the North Bank of the Tyne is a priority for the new North of Tyne Combined Authority? Councillor Pickard, I understand you're going to answer this. Okay, yes, thank you very much for the question. Since the Mayor was elected in 2013, she's been working hard with the Cabinet and myself to make sure the North Bank of the Tyne is a priority for this authority, for the North East Local Enterprise Partnership, and both the North East Combined Authority and now the new North of the Tyne Combined Authority. <clears throat> I can assure Councillor Thurloway that the new North of Tyne Cabinet are very clear on the importance of the river to our economy. As you know, the North Bank of the Tyne has some fantastic assets at Wall's End, such as the World Heritage Site at Segedunum, leading businesses such as SMD and Smolders, as well as local businesses as such as WD Close, who we have supported in growing, winning new business and in creating high quality jobs. We have also attracted world class businesses such as Reaver Offshore, Sapium and Eel to the Swan Centre for Innovation, 
while also accommodating local SMEs with growth potential. The river also has the important transport link at the Tyne Tunnel and the Port of Tyne, as well as increasingly vibrant offer at North Shields Fish Quay. We have used our powers and partnerships to secure investment in infrastructure, making it easier to travel to work along the river. An example of this is the North Tyneside Council have recently invested £4.7 million on the North Bank to remove the key transport barriers, enable industry to invest in available land along the River Tyne and create additional capacity on the road network and improve safe cycling and pedestrian routes for the many. I am delighted that through our devolution deal we now have access to substantial extra funding and additional powers that we would not have had previously. The new combined authority is working quickly and decisively to make a real and positive impact on people's lives, businesses and local communities. The North of Tyne economic vision sets out clearly what it will seek to achieve and North Tyneside's ambitious regeneration plans can be made a reality much more quickly than ever before. We have much to deliver through the North of Tyne and I'm sure the elected Mayor will be steering you through over the coming months as interim Mayor of the combined authority. Following the creation of the Combined Authority, we are working in conjunction with the LEP to secure the final phases of the Swan site, and in addition, the North of Tyne Combined Authority have already prioritised specific work at Wall's End with Segedunum and at North Shields and the Fish Quay. I can give you our assurances that we will continue to work with the new North of Tyne Authority to regenerate our borough and to create the conditions needed for business to flourish and attract inward investment. Do you have a supplementary question, Councillor Thurlaway? No, I don't. Right. Uh, can we move on to question four, Councillor Thurlaway? Yes. Um, do you want the to elect take this read or do yes. you want to read it out? I'll read it out, Chair. You're not competing with Councillor Johnson for performance, are you? Uh, I, yeah. Just wait until the next meeting. <laughs> Would the elected mayor provide the council with an update on the regeneration of Wall's End? Councillor Pickard. Okay, thank you, Chair. I hope all members took the opportunity to look at the report that the Cabinet agreed on the 26th of November, which set out our ambitions for North Tyneside. In doing that, we look back at significant changes in Wall's End with investment in education, leisure, affordable housing, infrastructure, and in the economy, both in terms of work along the North Bank and in improving the town centre. As we read at Cabinet, we want to support businesses and residents to create more and better jobs, especially in the Walls End area. Also connect those parts of the area that do not have strong transport links, and we also want to improve the housing offer and improve the sense of place and community and to help narrow the gap in life chances. Right now, we are delivering additional work on the Swan site, including expanding by another three floors the Swan Centre for Innovation, this is part of our wider ongoing project to transform the former Swan Hunters shipyard into a hub for offshore renewable energy and marine sectors. There are also improvements in the transport network, affordable homes at the sites of the former Bonchester and Beadnell Courts, as well as Purley Close and Perth Gardens, as well as work to improve poor quality private rented homes. Our next steps will be to, deliver, to develop a long-term master plan for South Dunham, Consider the options for the delivery of swans. Continue the developed Walls End Customer First Centre as a community hub. Work with private sector partners to see if we can refurbish the GB Hunter Memorial Hospital building. Now it's no longer a hospital, we want to return it to community use. Refurbish and bring the Buddle back into use and continue to examine other opportunities for affordable homes. I look forward to updating the Council on these projects as they start to take shape. Do you have a supplementary question, Councillor? No, Thalloway? I don't, Chair. Thank you. That brings the Council meeting to an end this evening. Can I wish you all a good night and a safe journey home?